it's interesting, you cross some sort of threshold whereby, you know, the, the value of creative is obvious, you know, it's starting to become enough. And, and all of a sudden, within a month, we, we started doing more volume on Sendle than we were on TwoShare, even though TwoShare had been going for two and a half years and Sendle had only been going for a month or two. And then the second month, we doubled that volume. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 129 of the Startup Playbook podcast. I'm your host, Rohit Parkova, and each week I interview successful founders, investors, and subject matter experts on how they got started, strategies they use succeed, and their advice to current and future entrepreneurs. I'm delighted to have the co-founder and CEO of Sendal, James Chin Moody, as my guest for this episode. James has a really interesting background, previously with the CSIRO and as the Chief Systems Engineer at FedSat, the first Australian satellite to launch in over 30 years. He is now the co-founder and CEO of Sendal, Australia's first 100% carbon neutral courier service. Since launching in Australia in 2014, the business has expanded to the US, partnered with major e-commerce players such as Shopify and eBay, has grown to over half a million account holders and raised over $50 million in funding. In this interview, we covered a range of topics, including the benefits of systems thinking, the five H's of Sendal's company culture, the hell yeah decision-making framework, how to build a reputation with investors, and much more. Without further ado, here is my interview with James Chin Moody. James, welcome to the Startup Playbook podcast, and thanks so much for taking time to join us this morning. Good morning. It's great to be here. So James, for those people that may not be as familiar with you or your background, do you want to share a little bit about your story and what got you here today? Yeah, sure thing. Um, So my background, I'm an electrical engineer. Um, actually started my career building satellites. So uh, nothing to do with logistics at all. But yeah, so that was me as a, as a uh, you know, sort of getting my hands very dirty in the, in the electrical engineering space. I ended up joining the CSIRO after that, um, uh, where I looked after business development for the land and water division, uh, and then looked after business development for the organization as a whole. And uh, before eventually leaving and uh, looking to, to you know, go back to building, you might say, uh, which is when the whole journey uh, with Sendal began. It's always fascinating to kind of hear a lot of the background of, of all the guests that we have on the show. Uh, I don't think I've had anyone that's built satellites before on the, on, on the show, which, you know, obviously is such an interesting background. Like, first of all, what was that sort of experience like? And I guess what was that sort of transition from uh, building satellites to CSRO to, to kind of jumping in and launching what eventually became Sendal? Yeah, it's, I mean, I'm basically a giant nerd and I was always passionate about space. It was funny, I was passionate about two things, space, and then the more I became passionate about space, I became passionate about the environment. And, and I think a lot of folk who do work in the space industry start to do this. We're all on one spaceship with a, you know, a closed loop atmosphere and we've got to do the best we can with the resources we have, right? And so, you know, throughout university, yeah, I did a lot. I, I was part of the Australian Student Space Association, a whole lot of things there but also started to get into, involved in tree planting and ended up um, being uh, co-chair of the United Nations Environment Program Youth Council as well. So I was really pushing down those two uh, directions simultaneously and was very fortunate to, to really be part of, it was Australia's first satellite in 30 years. It was called FedSat. And we, we bought, built and launched it for the Centenary of Federation. Um, and then moved from, from basically building a satellite to being uh, part of a company that took satellite data and turned it into environmental intelligence. It was my way of combining those two passions together. And it was that journey the, that led me to the, the whole remote sensing journey, as it's called, uh, that led me to the CSIRO. You know, I imagine that building a satellite is not a, a novel task by, by any means. You know, what were, I guess, some of the, the lessons uh, that you picked up either mm. from your time there or from the CSIRO that you sort of apply to the way that you sort of think about Sendal or, or business? I think the, the most, the biggest lesson you have when you're building a satellite is that uh, one is that basically long lead times. You really do have to think in terms of, you know, some of the components. Now it's changed a lot, actually. It's changed a huge amount in, in 20 years where we're now going into these sort of micro satellite world where you can build a lot of them. And maybe if a couple don't work, it's okay. But in those, you know, in, in, the, in 20 years ago, you're building one. And, and the satellite we we're building was still a small sat. It was sort of, it was only the size of a bar fridge, by the way, we like to say, which is, you know, but had a lot of stuff packed into it. But the, the lead time for some of those components was um, 23 months, 
you know, 27 months. Like it was really a lot of deep thinking, you know, at the beginning in order to, to really make sure that everything came together at the end. And it's so funny because that's almost the opposite of agile, mm. you might say. Um, and, 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 but, but interestingly, you know, in our world, we're, we're in a world of a lot of partnerships. It's the same thing. There is lots of you, you, you know, you need to be prepared in advance. You need to be thinking um, longer term as well as then being able to execute in the short term. So I think I learned a lot there. I, I think the other thing I learned is it's, you know, I, I'm a very hard on a systems engineer. I love the idea of plugging things together and trying to understand a broader system. My team chose to me that everything in my head is a model. Um, and uh, I think they know me better than I know myself, right? It was like, because really I do, my, my brain works very much around how to, you know, how do things fit together? It's the interfaces actually in many cases that count more than actually, you know, what's happening inside the black box. But it's really about thinking about the overall system and how can you construct systems. And I think when we, when I think about what we've ended up building with Sendle, um, and I'm very fortunate that I had some amazing folk on that journey with me, but we've really, you know, taken a very system level approach to that and, you know, created something that we, we hope adds a lot of value. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, obviously, uh, I, I think there's a lot that we will we'll kind of talk about Sendle as well through this, throughout this interview. But, you know, one of the things that you just mentioned was, you know, talking about thinking about systems and how things sort of come together. And, you know, one of the things with this interview, uh, with this podcast or interviewing successful founders is it's very easy to sort of look at the sort of end result of what the business is like now. But, uh, you know, I guess a lot of people might not know that Sendle actually started off as a sharing platform first and the business took, uh, went through quite a, quite a pivot. Do you mind kind of sharing what that sort of story was in sort of the initial iteration and um, I guess what the process and, and journey was like to, to kind of end up to what Sendle is today? Yeah, it is, it is funny the way the world works because we didn't set out intending to create a you know, a digital career or anything. Um, we actually uh, set out at the very beginning and, and I had um, uh, two, young, two young children, uh, you know, uh, so, did, so did the co-founder, our co-founder Patusha. You know, we, we were like, it was literally how do we, the, the original idea of the business was how do we help people to give things that they no longer need to each other? And so we actually created a, a, a giving marketplace. The idea being that, yes, there's a whole lot of stuff you can sell, but you know what, if you've got a bag of baby clothes, it generally you can't really sell that, but you still want that to go to another home, both because you love the things in that, you know, that, that, those items, but also uh, you want to avoid landfill and waste. And, and so the original, where we started was actually a, a, a network where we could help people give things and we quickly realized as we were building that ad, and, that, and, and of course, everyone likes free stuff. So we, we ended up with about 50,000 people on that giving network, but we quickly realized that one of the, the you know, real limitations to the liquidity of that network was the shipping. And indeed, we also realized that that was probably the way we could actually create a, you know, we, we were a social venture, but, you know, have a self-sustaining business from that, which was, you know, turn, turn the normal idea of e-commerce on its head where you, you sell an item and give away free shipping. What happens if we get the items for free and you just pay for the shipping? And so we started to think very much around, you know, how could you solve, uh, you know, the shipping problem for, for, for our use case? And, but in hindsight, by the way, um, what we didn't realize, we probably stumbled on the very worst use case for shipping you could possibly imagine. Because uh, if you think about it, these were infrequent senders sending one thing at a time uh, who, you know, had to be really, really cheap because the residual value was, was, was low and it'd be really, really easy. Very, very simple to the extent that we could pick it up from your front door. Because um, we actually knew that what we were competing with was the rubbish bin from a convenience perspective. Mm. And, and so we were given this really interesting set of shipping conditions you know show me a, a very cheap very affordable uh super simple shipping and and also by the way the you know with a, with a, an even further condition that we wanted to make the whole thing carbon neutral because we really were there to to create you know add solutions to to benefit the environment and it was actually trying to solve those pieces you know we, we solved them for ourselves and, and we can talk about how we solved them in the end but you know at the end we, we basically created a national shipping network for our own purposes 
and it was 2014 when, um, you know, and, and we were doing that and that was great and the business was growing and everything, but this funny thing started to happen uh, in 2014, which was uh, some of our two share customers, some of our members were actually starting to use, what, what they would do is we'd find out was that actually start to, to use that network, not for giving things away, but they actually started to, to hack it, so to speak, for a shipping solution. Right. And so it would be like, I'll sell something on eBay. And we started to see these packages that would appear that would be, you know, have somebody's name written on them. And well, I'll sell it to you on eBay. And then I'll give it to you away on the giving network and to take advantage of the shipping. And that was the first time when we, we really started to, to have our eyes open that maybe there was a bigger thing. We'd, we'd built something bigger than just a giving network. And, and indeed that this entire problem of, we think of it now as micro business or small business shipping you know, it was actually a much bigger problem than we, than we originally realized. Yeah. And that's such a fascinating kind of insight into the way that your customers are, are utilizing that product or, you know, they find a particular problem. So that you're solving so useful that they're trying to find a way to hack the, the system. And, you know, oftentimes, especially for founders, there's a way or a solution that you kind of, or a vision of the product or, or how you want it to be utilized. And there can be this temptation to, try and uh, remove or, or add friction onto those, onto those particular users because they're not using it in the way that you want them to be utilizing it. I guess, was there a particular inflection point for you in terms of quantity or volume or like a specific uh, use case that, that led you to go, actually, we shouldn't prevent this and maybe there's an even bigger opportunity for us to focus specifically on this versus focusing on the, the sharing platform instead? Yeah, I, I think uh, the first thing we realized um, was that really we had built a good shipping solution in, in a giving marketplace. So, it, you know, I think the thing that the, the really big eye opener for me was when I, I started, you know, we, we looked at the, for example, Australia Post and the, the price that they were charging and, and still the case, you know, they'll, it, it's like 40, $45 to send 10 kilograms from Sydney to Perth, right? And you'll line up at the post office. Um, for the privilege of, of doing that. And, you know, we could, you know, send it for around 20, half the price, you know, and, and I think we've just started to realize was that there was this, you know, entire, entire space here where we'd created this service that was cheaper, you know, more, uh, more convenient and greener. Right. And, and we started and I'll, I'll, you know, going back to my time at CSIRO and, and, and all that sort of, you know, looking at innovation, and, and, and industry structures and things like that, we also realised that Australia Post has a, a functional monopoly in place for this smaller end of town. And so we, we started to say, well, you know, we can't, you know, we haven't built a shipping solution, but what would, what would it look like if we did? And I think the big moment for us was when we started to, to, to really understand what are the pain points for small merchants? What are the pain points for small shippers? And, and what's now Sendle was very much built around this idea of, how could we methodically try to reduce the pain, you know, in all these different dimensions? And some of them are, are obvious, like, you know, door-to-door -door delivery, you know, lining up at the post office is clearly a big pain point, but, but also things like complicated rates, right? If, you're, if, if your day job is to go and manage logistics for a large company, company, well, that's fine, right? You're used to dealing with that. If what you're trying to do is to sell something online to make ends meet, or you're, you're transitioning your, your boutique who, that might have had a lot of foot traffic and now we're you know, moving to online in the face of COVID, right? The last thing you need to be doing is tables and ta it's trying to analyse tables and tables of rates and, and, and understand all that complexity. And I think you know, that together with customer support, like there was all these different things that we understood were actually painful in the shipping process. And, and what we did is we set out to try to, to do what we possibly could to, to remove all those pain points as much as we could. Yeah. And I, you know, again, I think it's always interesting for, for founders to kind of understand what that sort of process looks like as well. So, you know, it's not like you sort of magically switch overnight and go from a sharing platform to, to a logistics platform. But again, do, do you mind kind of um, sharing what, what was that process like in terms of, in terms of making that transition into my understanding you were sort of running both companies or trying to for, for a little while anyway? Yeah, we, um, it, was, it was one of the, the interesting things and, and, you know, lots of lessons. We learned so many lessons in that, in that journey. I think we, to start off with, we, you know, you, you think there might be an idea there, but you've got this other business that you're so passionate about, you know, by that stage, we've been running it for almost two and a half years, right? And so we, we, we started off at Sendle as a, 
as a you know sort of a little experiment in a box and that uh you know being able to ship and uh you know and then that actually seemed to work really really well and you know we learned a whole lot from that and then we allowed folk to create an account like the very first version of sendle you couldn't even create an account you could just send a parcel by putting in your credit card details but you know and then we create an account and so on and i think the the big inflection point for us came when um when we did actually you know it's it's, it's interesting you cross some sort of threshold whereby you know the the value you've created is obvious you know it started to become enough and and all of a sudden within a month we, we started doing more volume on sendle than we were on two share even though two share had been going for two and a half years and sendle had only been going for a month or two and then the second month we doubled that volume and and at that point we started to realize and you know and and, and we still were trying to, to to run both businesses um we were you know because we were passionate about both but I think it became, and it was it's my co-founder, he, he sort of said, you know, if you try to catch two rabbits, you need it, you don't end up catching either. And I think we realised that that there was, you know, you can't do two things with a small team. Trying to split your time across two different areas uh, is, is you just end up, you know, the, the only thing you have going for you when you're a small company is really agility, right? And, and agility requires focus. So, you, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't split our focus for too long. And so we, we ended up by the end of that year and it was one of the toughest decisions, I think, for everyone. Uh, you know, we originally to, to, to basically change and, and pivot the business because we had poured so much. You know, we, we really loved the purpose of, uh, of, of Two Share. We poured so much into that, um, you know, into what we were building there. But at the end of the day, we also realised that ultimately, there we, we, you know, our purpose could evolve and that our purpose actually could be to help all of the marketplaces, right? Let's let's be the plumbing that helps all of these interesting business models, all the small business merchants. Um, you know, let's help them thrive. And we, we basically realised that the entire industry, uh, in some ways, that the challenge when you have a functional monopoly in place is that you don't have enough choice. And it makes it, and it actually limits the ability for small business to grow. It limits the ability for new business models to to be created. So rather than just being a sh one sharing marketplace let's power all the sharing marketplaces and 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 really help them to thrive and i think that was the piece realizing that we could evolve our purpose right that was the thing that i think helped us to to make that transition yeah uh, like just a couple of things that you mentioned there i think you know when you mentioned that in the first month you'd already sort of exceeded what you were doing from from two share i think with when you get product market fit it's it's hard to tangibly uh, you know say what it is but you can definitely feel it and you can definitely kind of experience it and even though things aren't perfect things just kind of seem to seem to work but you, you know i think the the other kind of interesting point about kind of shutting down to share that i i uh, learned while listening back to some of the other interviews is you know obviously there was a very different sort of customer segment that you were going for so mm -hmm. you know I, to my understanding to share was sort of individuals versus you know obviously center list for small businesses and you made the decision that even though you were shutting down to share to not sell the database, even though people were sort of um, asking you because you had 50,000 essential customers that you could have, there was tangible sort of IP or, or things that you could have decided to, to utilize or capitalize on if you wanted to, but you decided not to. Again, do you mind sharing what kind of the thought process was like for, for you and, and why you made that particular decision? Yeah, we, um, so right very early, we'd actually, yeah, I'm a big believer that, that, how you do stuff or why and why you do it is just as important as what you do and you know part, because it's the journey as much as it is the destination you know i think uh, i think there's a you know and in the short term there might be trade-offs right like the fact that you know we're 100 percent carbon neutral for example as a, as a shipping company there's always trade-offs like you can you know in terms of the choices you make but in the long term it all lines up then in the long term you know, uh, being, you know, behaving properly and, uh, you know, doing what's right for all the stakeholders, all stakeholders actually lines up and, and, and I think is part of your license to operate as a business. So, um, so we, we, we were very early. We were, I think, Australia's first technology B Corp, for example. You know, we, we thought very deeply around, you know, um, things like how do we line up uh, our business model and the purpose, you know, and, and you know, and, and, and line those things up. So, so when it came time, you know, to transition the business, uh, I think one of the things we realised very much, you know, if, you, if you're stakeholder led, if you're thinking very hard about, you know, what's in the best interest of stakeholders, well, one of them was not to sell 
you know, uh, the business and, and to, you know, the database of the business or whatever it might be. That was a, it was a very short conversation, you might say, from that perspective, because you just realised, and, and it was far better to, to, to be elegant and do it, you know, in the right way and, and to respect the fact that, that, you know, customers own their own data ultimately. Um, than to to try to you know sell a, a part of the business. If if you know selling a business as a going concern is of course a very different thing. But you know we did, we decided at that point we couldn't actually operate two businesses. Yeah, I, you know I think um, authenticity is not something you can do part of the time. Like it's got to be something that that happens. Authenticity and values are things that you kind of live uh, through every single decision that you make. And so like I think that you know kind of obviously sort of comes across in. Uh, not just particular decisions that you make or what you sort of talk about, but obviously sort of how you decide to make every single decision from a, from a business perspective as well. But speaking of values, you know, obviously I know that Sendal is kind of known for the five H's of, of internal company culture. Actually at work, we did a session with Craig Davis, who was uh, one of the co-founders at Sendal as well, which is amazing, uh, amazing two days. I highly recommend it to anyone who's um, looking for, looking to do something similar for their own company. But um, again, do you mind kind of, first of all, sharing what the five H's of, of Sendal's uh, company culture are. But even, you know, I think a lot of people sort of talk about culture and talk about what they sort of want that to look like. Uh, how did the five H's come about? And I guess, what was that process in terms of discovering and sort of writing down what those values were for you as a business? Yeah, we, I mean, the five H's were, were actually a fundamental part, as, as fundamental as the tech, you might say. Um, and, and I was, you know, very fortunate that we, uh, I've had some amazing folk on the journey with me uh, because I think we all brought this to the company and, 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 you know, my, uh, the five H's in some ways were an expression and I'll, I'll talk about what they are in a second, but they were an expression of, of how we wanted to be the sort of people we wanted to work with as well as an expression of what we didn't want to be. And, you know, and, and the sort of things that we were looking out for that we thought could derail us in the future. And so um, the five H's are in order, humble, honest, happy, hungry, and high performing. And the most important thing is that they are actually in order because it's really easy. You can find high performers, but we want to find folk who are more humble than they're high performing. We can find folk who are honest, oh, sorry, who are hungry. We want to, they want to be more honest than they're hungry, right? And, and, and we also found that, that as we started to think about, we, that, that those things can cascade that I actually think that humility is the thing that, you, that, you know, honesty requires humility because you've got to be honest with yourself and with others, you know, positivity and, and, a, and a growth mindset, right. Is actually comes from honesty and being able to tell yourself or look at yourself hard, right. And, and, and also laugh and do things, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, hunger then comes from ambition comes from that positivity and that actually drives performance. And, and, and the reverse also occurs, right. Which is, you know, I think ego, is one of the way things that leads to dishonesty, right? And that actually can lead to negativity. That can lead to lack of engagement. That can lead to, to making, you know, to, to, to not performing. And, and so uh, as we started to really think about, you know, who did we want to work with, this framework was, was a really powerful way and, and also a way in which we could, you know, uh, start to, uh, you know, even, even, you know, communicate internally but also assess when we're talking with folk of who, who would we want to join the team. So, you know, every single person, every single member of Sendal uh, has come through this sort of five H lens, you might say. Um, and, you know, from, and we built it with, from ground up with those values, you know, at our very core. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, you know, that, that's a really important part of the puzzle is, you know, it's not just um, important to, I guess, identify and write down what those values are, but make sure that I guess your team sort of aligns to that. You know, really curious to know in terms of like the hiring process that you have for Sendal, uh, what does that look like? And I guess, how do you, through that process, how do you sort of try and identify those traits or those characteristics from people? Are there particular questions or particular sort of activities you do like i guess what what are the things that you're looking for when you're speaking to people about trying to identify whether they align with your values or not yeah i think i mean to be to be honest and i wouldn't pretend that our hiring process is the best in the world by any means or anything i mean to start with it was just uh have lots of conversations and just be really explicit that that's what we're looking for and and different team members would find different ways to make their own judgment um around that uh, I think a really important part of our hiring process in the other days is, is 
what we we think of we, we called hell yeah um and and it probably also comes to a sort of a philosophy we have around decisions which is that there's there's two different types of decisions right um there's there's sort of reversible decisions um i think amazon calls these two-way doors right decisions like where you can doors. yeah yeah right so there's reversible decisions which you can you know you can reverse and you, what you should really be doing with those decisions is making them as quickly as you can and hopefully getting 80 percent right you know and it's which is okay you know so that's fine then there's then there's another set of decisions which is those one-way doors the, the irreversible decision and you know and 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 what we believed was for those decisions, actually, it's not like yes or no, like the reversal, it's yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. These ones, there were three different answers to a question, right? And, and, and there were yes, there's no, and there's hell yeah, right? And, um, you know, again, it could be, uh, you know, a, a simpler, you know, like a, an example was, would you like a glass of water? There's yes, I'd like a glass of water. No, I wouldn't like a glass of water. Like, hell yeah, I'd love a glass of water because I'm parched, right? Like there's, there's a very big difference between a yes and a hell yeah. And I, I can, we can even now in hindsight, I mean, we, we took that at, you know, like it's the difference, you know, Kahneman um, type one, type two decision-making, all that sort of stuff you can talk about, but it's really about using the analytical and the emotional, the pattern matching part of your mind to make that decision. And, and what we found is there's certain things and, and, and in a business, you know, recruitment is the number one thing. That's a one-way decision, I believe. You know, also uh, which market do you go, you know, to pursue? Who do you take money from? Like, you know, uh, there's, there's all these different, you know, do you pivot the company? Like all these things which can, which for us need to be hell yeah. And what we do is we work at it until we either get to hell yeah or we decide that, you know, it's just a yes. And for one way decisions, sometimes a yes is actually worse than, than a no, right? Because a tepid yes in recruitment in some ways just, you know, th there's something there. And so, so really the, the biggest part of the process from the early days and it was a very easy you know because again when you're small you don't have any resources and you don't actually want a lot of process it was generally you know other than you know we'll, we'll look at skills and we'll find ways of assessing skills and this is what we mean in terms of culture and then how do we get to hell yeah right or are we hell yeah um, and we still do that um, you know my, my favorite is uh, you know after recruitment somebody you know we've got a different way you can assess it but you know somebody just coming out and going yeah hell yeah Right, like, and that's a that's a fantastic um, sort of discipline, you might say, without creating a huge amount of process that we we built from the in, in the business. And and everyone often, well, not everyone, but we often go through that 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 sort of point where you really want that role filled, but if you can hold off and say, I'm going to wait until we get to a hell yeah candidate, right? It makes all the difference in the end. And we've, there's been some really seminal moments for us in particular roles. Uh, where we have waited and, and waited till we got to that really great candidate. Yeah, at, at Amazon, we call that sort of raising the bar, very similar process, but it's um, mm. you know, five people that have five different interviews through a loop and you have to kind of justify with data and you have to not just meet the bar, you have to raise the bar for that particular role, um, which is kind of very similar to your hell yet. Like you really need to be convinced that that is the right person for, for that particular job. And as you said, it makes hiring very difficult and often a much more lengthy process and sometimes you miss out on good people, but... Um, like you said, sometimes a tepid yes is, is uh, you know, potentially more harmful than, than a no. But, you know, oftentimes, and we, you just kind of touched on this as well, for, for startups, you're often kind of resource constrained. You need to bring in someone desperately um, because the business is suffering. And there can be this temptation of, you know, this person's interesting or good enough. We should just bring them in and potentially bypass some of the, some of the things that we have. I think one of the best ways that I've kind of heard about this is that, the problems that you kind of identify never really go away. They just get exaggerated when, when you kind of do decide yeah. to put someone on. But I guess if, if you have, if you are in that kind of situation, then a little with previous businesses where I guess you have brought someone in that doesn't quite align, um, you know, what does that sort of process look like to identify that or, or how do you sort of manage that? And as, as a follow-up question to that, if, if you feel that someone isn't quite aligned, do you think that there is a way to sort of realign them to the values or do you think that it's a very sort of uh, black and white uh, yeah. identifier of someone? Uh, I think the first thing is it's never black and white. Uh, and in fact, we, uh, you know, we started with the five H's and, and, and it was really interesting. I think it was 2018 where we even went further and realized that, uh, you know, humility uh, in, in its own right is actually 
you know, sort of between two bounds, right? And one side, like all of these things were the more virtues, like in the Aristotelian sense, than they are values. Like, because, you know, on one side you've got ego, on the other side you've got, you know, submission, submissiveness, right? Like, and you've got this whole thing in the middle where you, you know, it's hard, you know, and, and you know, and, and, and honesty, right? Like there's dishonesty and that's easy, but, you know, there's, there's also the, 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 the thoughtless, you know, um, brutal honesty, which is not the sort of thing that we want to, to sort of create. So there was this really interesting thing that, yeah, it is, there is no black and white around, you know, the five H's for us. Like it is definitely something and everyone's striving to sort of think about how they want to behave and, and, and what choices are you making? Right. It's, and that's, that's actually, by the way, where I think values as a compass can actually help you too. Right. You know, is this, you know, I do what you said you would do. You know what I mean? Like that's a, that's a really good one to sort of say, am I holding myself to that standard? So you can use these things to sort of navigate in some ways. I, for me, the reason why recruitment has to be like, hell yeah, is because the moment you join your destiny with someone else's, like I often think that the two things that you should be doing as a manager or what you should expect as an employee, right, is, you know, one uh, you know, d- does that person have, you know, my best interests at heart or do I have that person's best interests at heart? And can we align those interests with the needs of the business? Right, they're the two conditions. And, uh, and it, at the moment, either one of those is not true, right? That, that is probably the time to part, right? And, but you've got to work at that. And, and, and for me, the, the reason why it's held here is because when somebody you know, aligns their destiny with that of the business. You need to work as hard as you possibly can to make sure that those conditions are true. And so for us, it is a lot of effort, you know. Um, uh, yeah. If it doesn't line up and, and it doesn't line up sometimes, that's okay. You know, we, we you know, probation for us is, is really important. And we try to, you know, it's probably one of the big lessons um, throughout the journey is to treat probation as a, you know, for both sides. Right. And, and it's basically a period of, you know, you can only learn so much in, a, in, a, in an interview for both sides. So let's use this period to really understand if there's going to be a fit in the long term. And, and I think that's the, the, you know, treating probation really seriously is the biggest tip that I'd give anyone who's sort of, you know, uh, on the, the earlier in the journey. One of the things that you just mentioned was, you know, doing what you, uh, what you say you will do. And one of the people that I spoke to in doing research for this interview is Adam Milgram, who I had on the mm-hmm. podcast a few weeks ago. Um, obviously, a venture partner at Giant Leap Fund, which was one of Sendel's early investors as well. And, you know, one of the things that he kind of mentioned was, you know, Sendel was obviously in a very different position when, uh, when they probably came across sort of Giant, uh, Giant Leap's table. But, you know, what kind of brought them a lot of conviction was you and, and kind of the founding team and, you know, specific things that he kind of mentioned was, you know, your reputation really sort of preceded you in terms of your ability to build networks, doing what you said and all of those sort of things. And Adam said that, like, you know, those are things that aren't just like they don't just kind of happen. Like a lot of that is sort of intentional as well. You know, I, I obviously a lot of founders that are sort of listening to to this podcast will probably be, you know, at either if not fundraising at the moment will potentially be fundraising kind of down the line. Do you have any advice in terms of, or can you share a little bit in terms of uh, what your approach has been in terms of building those relationships with investors or building that sort of reputation in the market? What are the specific things that you've done or, or what are things that have helped you uh, be successful specifically when it comes to sort of fundraising? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's very nice of Adam to say those things as well. Thanks Adam. Um, uh, I think the, you know, I, I, I was actually very fortunate in, you know, because I came from a large organisation from CSIRO and all that sort of stuff. And I was very fortunate that a few advisors, um, you know, so, so gave me some good advice early on. And one of, one of them that I've actually taken very, we took very much to heart in that journey was, and, and I think it's a, it's a really important sort of metaphor for startups, was thinking about the business in terms of value creation milestones. And, and probably the best way of, the best analogy for me is, you know, that what that, what that really means is, is like my, my analogy for startups is like you're on a boat, right? And you start off and it's like two of you or three of you or whatever it might be, you know, sitting in a boat, you're rowing, you're in a little, you know, it's a, it's a rubber inflatable or whatever it might be and you're, you're trying to get to an island, right? And on that island, there are some, there, there's a better boat, 
or you know, uh, and 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 maybe some navigation equipment and some provisions and maybe a couple more people, right? And then what you're trying to do is say upgrading the boat, and then you're trying to get to the next island, right? And then there's an electric motor, and then and so on, and you're basically, and the waters get choppier and choppier. But but the interesting thing is that the the the, the startup journey, as opposed to say a bootstrapped type journey where you're doing it on your own steam, right, is one where you really are in this sort of you know step change of you know value creation milestone which is really a raise you've created a certain amount of value and then you're looking for provisions to get you to you know that next island which is the next raise until you get to sort of exit velocity and then you're you know then you're, you're sailing the world and and off you go and it's a very different journey um but thinking about the business in terms of those value creation milestones and not just thinking it's probably back to you know trying to think about lead, lead times not just think about the next one but trying to think two, you know, one or two or three ahead, right? And and you know, and 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 sort of okay, well, we're doing this, but we're trying to get here in order to then get there. That has served us extremely well in terms of thinking about and 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 by the way, trying to really dive into that. What is what does this sort of value look like? You know, it could be and and for every business, it will be different. Like it could be it's, it's revenue or repeat usage or you know, even as simple as we're going to create a you know. A, a you know full stack team in this area or whatever might be thinking about how much value am i creating in each one of those journeys is an extremely powerful way of also talking about where you're trying to go as a business and so i think um, i've had this feedback from some folk for example in our series a you know folk pulled out the, the deck that we were using in our seed and we're very proud of the fact that what we talked about in seed in terms of the value creation milestone we're trying to get to in series a we'd actually done it Right, we'd actually done the things that we said we were going to do in seed in Series A, and so and there's nothing more satisfying when you when you're you know say doing a pitch deck or whatever it might be, of being able to copy and paste and say the stuff I said I was going to do, I'm now going to move that to the to the left, and that's what we where we're at, and this is what we're going to do next, and then being able to move that to the next and and and, and so on, and 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 I think that again that's really hard. I don't want to pretend it was easy and we we're very lucky in the journey too. We've been very, very lucky because of the, the industry that we found ourselves in and the problem we found to solve. Um, because the hard parts around doing what you said you would do is, you know, uh, yes, actually doing it, but actually not saying it, right? Unless you're really confident that you're going to be able to do it, but you've got to be very careful as well that you're not limiting yourself. Mm you know, and, and your level of ambition at the same time. So it's a really, really hard thing. And we've been, you know, very lucky in that journey. Is there anything that you've done to, to help you sort of identify what that sort of next, uh, to use your analogy, what, what that next island is and, and what you need to get there? So, you know, oftentimes kind of things move and change so rapidly mm. within a startup that it can be really hard to predict what will happen in six months, let alone in a couple of years down, down the line. Is there anything that you've kind of utilized to help you sort of reverse engineer that process or get more clarity in, in what, you know, uh, how to better predict what, what that should look like? Uh, I think the, yeah, it is really hard. I, you know, it's always messy when, you, when you're trying to work out as a team, like what that looks like and plotting it forward. I think the, and, you know, and that's okay, right? Like that's, that's one of the things we, we, we keep reminding ourselves that this is part, that the, the point being this is messy until we can all get to, to hell yeah on, on that part of the journey. I think the, the one, again, we, we, we started our business was still too complex, right? You know, and it's still too complex, you know, like, you know, the fundamentals of the business, you know, it's probably the only way you can start to, to, to get there. Because if you sort of say, these are the things, this is what we are, this is our model, this is what matters, right? And then start to go, okay, well, how does that mature over time, right? That's the thing that can then start to allow you to, to set those, right? But in the early days, the whole point is to actually, you know, and this is where I mentioned luck earlier, right? Mm -hmm. We were just lucky that we had a good, you know, we had some, a good sense of things, that even, even if we didn't know quite what we were doing, and you know and, and, and around but it just felt like this was the right thing to do you know taking responsibility for every parcel and building very much around the pain points of this particular set of customers felt like the right thing to do and that was the the piece that then allowed us to extrapolate into to different areas and and i, I also look back at two you know we're too complicated 
like the two-sided marketplace and all the personas we thought were very sort of, you know, it was great to build all these personas and so on. But in hindsight, what I worked out is we just had a very, very confused business compared to the one we have now, which is we just want to send a parcel to anywhere in the world for small business, right? And, and focus absolutely on that particular market. We are here to help small business thrive. That's where therefore the micro businesses, the folk who, who basically pay more than they should and get less than they deserve, right? And we build a business for them and the product is very, very simple. You know, let's send a parcel up to 25 kilograms, you know, anywhere in the world. And that's, you know, the simplicity of that allows you for them to think about how do you build out you know, that business in the, you know, to, to, and, and then the milestones, hopefully, to get there. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, you kind of mentioned on, in terms of luck and simplicity. I know one of the other things that you're really, um, you know, passionate and speak a lot about is the need for focus as well. Uh, you know, I think especially when, you know, oftentimes people think about, you know, opportunities and how scarce it can be. But oftentimes, you know, especially when speaking to a lot of the guests on the podcast, it's the opposite problem, which is you have almost an unlimited number of opportunities ahead of you. And it can be really hard to focus on, on the right things and make sure that you're sort of still moving rather than being sort of distracted by all of these shiny things um, ahead of you. Can you, uh, you know, again, sort of share what does that, is there any particular process that you use or, or anything that you sort of utilize to ensure that you're, um, you know, as a leader, as a CEO, that you individually or you as a business are focusing on the right things? Yeah, I'd, I'd say my, my team is also much better at it than I am. Like, it's just great. Like, so there's a, uh, because I think there's always that challenge as well between like focus and, you know, option and optionalities. And again, these things are hard to thread. Um, I think the way that we, um, uh, the, the way that we sort of manage it, one is it's far better to have a, you know, it's hard to say no, right? It's hard to say no to stuff. The best way to say no to things is to have a great big help you like, yes, right out there. And I think that's the, that was one of the big realizations that we had, right? It's, you know, if, if you look at small things, you can, you know, there's lots of opportunities, right? And each of them by themselves will look really, really good. But, and, and you'll, you might say yes to them and get completely distracted. Instead, find the, the great big yes to say to, that, you know, something to, right? Like we're going this way. It's actually the thing that gives you the context to say, I would love to do this, but I'm sorry, we can't do this this quarter or we can't do this or whatever it might be because we're doing that thing. And, and I think from our perspective, that's the focus. Like in some ways, I go back to the two share and Sendle piece. We had to say a great big hell yeah to Sendle in order to give us the, you know, and it was one of the hardest things. I mean, I actually, I, 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 I did, I, I cried the day that we shut two share because it felt like a part of my life was being wrenched away, right? But the thing that gave us the confidence is because we had a great big hell yeah and a bigger purpose that we could actually fulfill in, in Sendal. Yeah, I absolutely love that. And those are, those are things that, you know, I think a lot of founders experience, but they don't really kind of hear other founders kind of sharing that as well. So thank you for, for sharing that. So James, I feel like I could talk to you all day uh, and I want to make sure that we get to sort of audience Q&A. So last set of questions from me, um, just a quick reminder for those of you that are tuning in live, uh, if you have any questions for James, um, please submit them by the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, so James, one of the things I was really uh, interested, like, you know, I found really interesting in doing sort of research for this interview as well is that I assumed that Sandal kind of, you know, you had your own sort of trucks and your own sort of logistics um, set up, but, you know, even um, one of the things that Adam mentioned is, uh, you know, one of the things that you and Sandal have been really good at is understanding what are the things that you should build and what you should own versus what are things that you should build on top of. And again, you know, I guess part of that sort of comes down to, to the focus discussion that we were just having a little bit earlier, but, uh, you know, I guess, how do you sort of identify those particular things that as a business are important things that, you know, that you need to control? And what are things that you can sort of, um, you know, build on top of via partnerships or, um, you know, other things that kind of essentially supercharge what, what you're trying to do? Yeah, it's, it's a, a, again, everything's a balance, right? Because ownership, and, and I, that, by the way, there, there's a, the purpose-led world. Actually, there is this big shift where, you know, it used, the world used to be all about ownership and control, right? Very much this, this sort of, I need to own it and control it all to one where you can actually sort of, you know, uh, you trade off that for the ability to scale really quickly, 
right? And I'm going to create partnerships and I'm going to create a network and I'm going to create things, you know, in, in which we're going to plug pieces together and, and make new things out of, you know, building on the, the, the amazing things that have happened with others. And you can see that in lots of industries. Like even if you think about the cloud and you think about, you know, how, think about creating a business now. Once upon a time, you need an accounts department that were, you know, running the books, but now you just build on top of zero, right? Or QuickBooks or whatever it might be, right? And so you've got, uh, it's like all these things that you plug together as a business, we just keep on plugging together other pieces. And, and I think the, the real answer to that was, um, you know, again, focusing on what are we trying to create and who are we trying to create it for? So starting from that end, you know, again, we want to be, or you know, again, what 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 makes us different? You know, what where are we different as a as a digital career? We are the only, I believe, the only hundred percent, you know, career built for the needs of small business. That's what we want to build for. That's all we want to build for, right? To help those small businesses to thrive, and and we want to do it in a way that's you know, hundred percent carbon neutral. So you know, and 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 for us, you know, using that as the thing that we're building for and try not to stray too far from, from that is, is actually the piece that then allows you to make decisions around, okay, what do we, you know, if, if it exists already, maybe we can, you know, incorporate into the network. If it doesn't exist, well, then we have to build it ourselves. And you can start to take that approach as to, you know, as, as how you do it. And with a view to, again, you know, uh, we want to fulfill as much of our purpose as we possibly, possibly can. Mm. I love that. And I think it's, uh, I think you're right. Like, I think it's so important to have a purpose or a vision because it's much easier to identify, you know, even with the five H's, it's much easier when you write those things down to identify whether something fits or it doesn't uh, versus if you don't have those things in place, you uh, it's a lot easier to get swayed or kind of lured into to different things as well. Fantastic, James. I'm going to shift gears and move over to audience Q&A. So uh, first question I'm going to pick out is from Tony Tan who, uh, shout out to Tony as well. He's got a great company called Still Fresh that everyone should check out. But uh, his question is, how do you deal with employees that fuck up? Particularly when it comes with an important customer at the very beginning of your startup. They get annoyed, you get annoyed, the blame game happens. How do you manage the situation so that everyone takes responsibility for the next one? Uh, I mean, yeah, what, the, the, hopefully it's a learning opportunity, <laughs> right? And Tony, I think that's the, I mean, I've, I've messed up, I've, uh, you know, we've all messed up sort of. And, and I think that, that, again, this sort of comes down to the five H's probably is, is one thing as well as like, you know, we, we've been very fortunate. My, you know, I remember one team member in particular who sort of posted to everyone about his, his mistake and his, how he did it. And it was very, very honest around all of it. Um, and that, that was a big thing to do for the whole company. And he really, really owned it. And, and I thought, that, that's amazing, right? Because one, that he's learned the lesson himself and that he shared it with others and so we can hopefully all, you know, learn from it too. So, um, look, that's hard because there's always, and it's easier said than done because there's always other things, but it's, you know, back to that, that whole question, like it becomes a real problem if ego gets involved or, you know, if, if uh, folk are trying to hide, you know, um, you know, the mistakes or whatever it might be. That's, that's the, that's the sort of challenge in all of that. Hope that answers the question, Tony. Uh, next question is from Dave Ray, who, uh, who's asked, what's the biggest difference you've encountered in your U S business compared to Australia? Mm. It's a uh, really good question. We, we, we launched in the U S at the end of uh, 2019 and uh, you know, it's been an amazing experience. We're already doing about 15% of our revenue from the US, which is, you know, which is, is great. We've got the most amazing team over there. Um, I think the, I mean, the biggest thing was to, we, we learned, we learned that it's, it's no trivial thing. Again, this is the question of focus when you, when you have one dimension of a business, right, which is focusing on one country and uh, one set of pain points, you know, to suddenly start splitting your attention as a business uh, and working out what's common and what's different, right. You should not underestimate that. And, you know, and, and, and to do it properly. Um, and we were, you know, again, we, uh, again, I, I look at it as we were very fortunate because we've got such an amazing set of folk in there who, and, and, and some of them have got experience running, you know, a CMO, Eva, for example, has come from, a, from, from Airbnb and she's got experience looking across multiple countries and understanding, you know, um, 
thinking through the differences that you need to do and and you know her the way she's entered uh, the US market has been absolutely tremendous with her with her team but i think the, the the biggest lesson there is don't underestimate the fact that you've got to go back and and really you know forget everything you've done like we we had a 5 year old business right that then had to sort of forget everything and then go back to being able to chase product market fit Right. And really, you know, to, to the point where every week there was the team sitting down, what's limiting product market fit? What can we do? What can we build? And, and so on. So trying to not be too much of that existing business and go back to this sort of quick cycle. How do we do it in order to, to make sure? And there were some things we did within a month that we had to change because we worked out that they didn't work. The next question is from Cameron Harris, um, who asks, how much of an advantage do you feel having a blank page to build your own culture from scratch is uh, against, well, I guess, compared to Australia Post? Uh, I think that, you know, ultimately, you know, what is culture? I, there's a, there's a, I, I always struggled for a long time because um, I remember at CSIRO, we had these, I remember a cultural presentation where somebody said, you know, culture is the way we do things around here. And I found that to be an incredibly unhelpful um, <laughs> way of thinking about culture because yes, it is. But like, and so I find for me that the, I finally found something that I found really powerful around culture, which is culture are the decisions we make without thinking about them. And, you know, it's so if you think about it, you start off and, you're like even when you join a company right like you you might start and it's like for the first week you'd be hyper alert right you're looking for all the cues you're trying to work out like should i speak up at this meeting should i open the door for somebody else what you know how should i you know what should i how do i emoji on slack or whatever it might be right like you're, you're hyper alert around all these sorts of things and then eventually over time right those decisions that you're making very explicitly start becoming implicit right? I will naturally just try to shout my colleague a coffee or I will, you know, all these sorts of things. And, 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 and it's interesting, the, the, the implicit decisions become the culture of the company, the decisions we're making without thinking about it. And the reason why I find that's really useful is because, you know, it does sort of point to the fact that if you allow things, so say somebody swears at meetings or, you know, talks over someone else, and you don't try to pull that up, that actually becomes something that becomes implicit and we don't think about it anymore and just the way we behave. But over time, you know, that becomes the way in which your company operates. And that can be deeper and deeper into the decision-making process or the company or whatever. And, and the reason why culture, I think, again, back to that definition of it, you know, culture as strategy or culture as a way of, you know, of, of being able to perform is because it's very hard. You can't come into a business and say, okay, everyone, start implicitly making decisions this way without thinking about it, right? You can't because the whole definition is that these are, these, are, these are decisions that you're not thinking about. So you can't think about not thinking about making decisions, right? And, and so, yeah, I mean, and, and this is where Agile, this is why, you know, again, the, the one thing I've learned, and I've been very fortunate, my, you know, my co-founder, Sean, has taught me so much around thinking in this way because I came from a world where it was all waterfall and it was all big and, and so on, but, you know, they, they're making small decisions, making them quickly, making, you know, breaking things up, right? Those are all implicit things that it's very, you know, you need to build into the culture from day one, right? It becomes just the way we do stuff back to then the actual definition, you know, the, the earlier definition of the way we do things around here. No, it's the, it's the decisions we make without actually having to talk about or think about. So I think that we're very fortunate that we've been able to build a company, you know, with a set of decisions, with the five H's, you know, and, and haven't had to have a legacy of how many years. But, but of course, yeah, every company has got advantages and disadvantages as well. And a national icon like Post has also got its own particular pieces of pride in its culture and the importance and, and what it does and its way of operating as well. So it doesn't, you know, it's just different. Uh, next question is from Saurabh Arya, who uh, says, instead of offsetting, is there any strategic direction to actually change the operations of Sendal to stop carbon emissions? Yes, uh, great question, because I think we, we started off and, you know, it was about finding, you know, idle capacity and networks where we could and then offsetting the deliveries. Um, but that, that is offsetting. Uh, I think, you know, now that we're becoming bigger, we're saying look at the carbon intensity of our operation. And uh, an example of that is, um, for example, Bonds, one of our providers, Bonds, very recently, and, uh, you know, we, we worked with them. They've, they've now gone to electric vehicles 
that are actually harvesting energy from the, the roof of their depot. Right. And I love this because it's, you know, uh, you know, really is time to get into the closed loop sort of circular economy type stuff. Like if you think about, they, they have trucks, but they also have trucks that sit in one space for quite a, a while while they're, you know, waiting to be loaded or unloaded and they own a roof, right? And there's a whole lot of wasted energy going onto that roof that they're now harvesting. And you put those three things together and you actually, you know, can, can massively reduce the carbon into or zero out the carbon intensity of that part of the journey, right? That particular, uh, you know, the scope of emissions. So, um, yeah, I think the, the answer is, you know, that's, that's where we want to go eventually is, you know, over, over 10% of, of global carbon emissions are from transport and logistics. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, there's, there's a whole, you know, COVID, we didn't even talk about COVID, but which is probably a good thing, but, you know, there's, the world's had this massive shift and massive response from COVID. Look, but there's another crisis that's not going away, which is the climate crisis, you know, and that, you know, uh, we've seen bushfires in, you know, the West coast of the U S you know, where we're heading into bushfire season again in Australia. Like this, this is a, you know, this and all the other, the imp impacts of climate change are not going away. And, you know, I think ultimately as part of this massive shift to online where we're, we're, we're seeing, well, I think it's incumbent on everyone to, 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 to actually, you know, start taking responsibility for the impacts, the environmental impacts of that um, as well. And that's, that's pretty much a fundamental piece that we've also built Symbol on. Fantastic. And the last question is not really a question, it's more a statement, but I thought it would be a good note to end this podcast on. Um, it's submitted by Louisa Summer, who says, thank you for building Sendal. The world is a better place because of you. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. And yeah, our purpose, um, uh, you know, the way we state our purpose now, we, we want to be shipping that's good for the world. And we want to be good for the world because we want to level the playing field for small business and big business. We want to help those small merchants thrive. Like that is really, you know, inequality is another one of those long-term challenges and we want to be good for the world because we're you know basically pushing down on 100 percent carbon neutral and hoping everyone else is going to follow suit so thank you for that that is it's nice to hear because it is absolutely what we want to be and what we're trying to build our business for fantastic that's a great way to to end this interview um thank you to all of you for uh joining us live and, and for submitting your questions and james once again thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show and for sharing your experience and insights it's been fantastic thanks for having me been great thanks everyone bye thanks for listening to episode 129 of the startup playbook podcast as always full show notes from this interview will be available at startupplaybook.co i'll be back at 8 a.m next tuesday the 29th of september with another live episode and my guest for episode 130 is returning guest and one of my favorite people in the australian startup ecosystem and founder of working theory angels rachel newman I'm really excited about that interview and hope that you can join us. But in the meantime, if you enjoyed this interview, please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. As always, thank you for tuning in and I'll see you next week.